Thank you to everyone who's been able to join. We appreciate your time here. Uh, today, our facilitator is Joseph. Joseph is in Accra, Ghana. I think he can share more about himself as he continues with the presentation. But he is also a senior software engineer at Andela, right? He's a full stack software engineer, um, six years of experience building robust and scalable cloud applications with Ruby and React. So if I have mentioned anything that's a keyword for you and you're like, oh God, I want to know more about Ruby or React or like building scalable cloud applications, you know what? This is your person. So make sure you get his contacts and you can reach out to him. But I think like I said, let's maintain the questions to the second part uh, so that uh, Joseph can go through his presentation first. Yeah, so Joseph, over to you. And thank you so much for facilitating. Yeah, thanks, Mercy. Uh, I'm good. I'm very humble to, uh, to be uh, doing this presentation. Uh, so today, uh, let me quickly share my screen and then we can get it started. And thank you all for joining. Okay, uh, so uh, today we'll be talking about writing software that scales by default. So I know you, a lot of people will be wondering about what is going to be the content of this uh, presentation. Uh, even me myself, when I started uh, when I started writing the slide, uh, I think I I created like about three to four slides, and then I had to delete them again because uh, it is a broad topic, and and I and I don't think uh, I'll be able to cover everything here uh, just about in about twenty to thirty minutes because I would like to give you guys the opportunity to also uh, share some insights on what you know about the topic as I present. So today, uh, the agenda will just be strictly. Uh, so I'll do a brief introduction about myself. Then I'll do a deep dive into the workshop. And then I also want to listen to your questions. And then probably we'll do some answers. And then I also want to listen to some contributions from you guys. Because I know we have a lot of talents uh, out there. And I, have, I know we have a lot of people that even have much experience than I do. So I'm just going to be sharing what I know and what I've learned uh, over the time uh, doing the process of uh, writing softwares uh, for startups and then writing software for uh, enterprise uh, companies. So uh, my name is Joseph uh, Kosi Abokwe. Uh, the last name over there is a bit difficult to pronounce, but I will say just keep it at Joseph. Uh, so um, Ruby, I hold a bachelor's degree in computer science. Uh, my core stacks are Ruby on Rails, as you can see on the left-hand side. And then uh, in the middle there, you can see my uh, social networks handles. So on GitHub, you can check out my GitHub profile on jcosi. And then uh, my Twitter account is also there. So I work for Andela. I've been working at Andela for about a year plus now. For those of you who don't know about how Andela operates, uh, let me take some seconds to throw light on that. Andela helps hundreds of companies build and manage high performing team. And when you join Andela, what you got to do is like, you'll be placed uh, to work on a partner of Andela uh, that currently matches uh, your core tech stack. So currently I work for Lessonly, I work for Lessonly who is one of Andela, Andela's partner for approximately a year now. So what is Lessonly? Lessonly is a simple training software that helps team learn, practice, and do better work. The company is based in the US, uh, precise, precisely at Indianapolis. We are trusted by companies like Zendex, GitHub, T-Mobile, Airbnb, uh, US Cellular, Uber, and many more. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me, and let's talk about technology, design, software architecture, and data science. So uh, what to expect? So today, uh, these are some of the things that I'll be talking about here. Uh, fundamentals of application architecture, thinking about just functionality. Oh, it works, some kind of thing like that. I uh, also will be talking about some techniques and patterns of how to craft and divine software that perform at scale. Uh, I also will be trying to I also help you try to identify some performance bottlenecks in code and some cross-cutting concerns. I'll also like to listen to you for your contributions. 
So what is this not about? Uh, I decided to add this slide because, uh, as I said earlier on, there's a lot to be covered. Uh, there's a various aspect to handling this topic. Uh, so I hope after this topic, uh, there will be some other follow-up topics that we can do together with other en uh, underlying engineers or anyone outside there who is willing to share some insight about this. So I'll not be writing code for today. That will be for another day. I will not be talking about infrastructure. Maybe, uh, probably I'm not the right person to do that for now. I'll also not be attempting to cover all the design patterns or architectures that exist out there. Uh, that's it's a topic for another day and also not be trying to cover all to attempt to cover all the performance bottlenecks. So before we start, I just want to take some few seconds out of your time. Uh, just read, uh, read what you have there. So imagine that you have a 500 gig, uh, gig log file that contains one hash per line. Uh, your goal is to get a unique, you're not limited programming language and approach, how would you solve these tasks? Remember, remember about the performance and memory consumption. So feel free to share your thoughts about this. Um, you can unmute yourself and let me know what you think about this before I go, uh, before I continue the presentation. Thank you. So I'll just give some couple of uh, minutes, uh, then uh, we'll see if someone is willing to say, share something about this. Okay, uh, do we have anybody uh, willing to share something? There's no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, there's not even a single approach to this. Even if you ask me now, do you know the answer? <laughs> I will laugh. So, uh, so I just want to see how, whatever, whatever thoughts uh, you have about this. So if not, uh, we can move ahead. So I will just yeah. wait for, okay. Yeah, hello, Joseph. Yeah. Um, this summer, um, finished with um, Andela. Okay. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. And you? I'm also good. I'm also good. So I decided to join. I just joined. So I just saw your problem. Um, I think the file is very huge, 500 gigabytes. It can't sit on um, one machine. So it's normally um, you don't have 500 um, when you load this particular file in one single machine, it's not going to be possible because it's uh, extremely big, 500 gigabytes. So um, the best way I'll solve this is um, to use an object storage like S3 or similar kind of sto storage um, on other, um, how do you call it, infrastructure, whether GCP or AWS or Azure. I'm sure they have similar S3 technologies, um, which stores the data in bits. So what I'll do is, um, after storing the data, since we want to get um, one hash per line, so that means um, the best way to um, go over this data is to stream the data. So S3 has this feature where it can stream um, line by line of the data so that you can process it. So it's, it's, you don't have to like load this whole 500 gigabits on maybe a 32 gigabit machine. So you can stream the data like line by line. And to make this thing extremely fast, um, depending on the time, you can um, add some kind of queue, you know, to handle, um, how do you call it, to process this data. So you don't all do all the processing on one single data but you can also um, queue it and allow multiple machines to check um, the uniqueness of the hashes. So I, I think that I just joined, so that's my thoughts on it. I've not really thought into details. Okay. Oh, great, great, great. Thanks for that, uh, for that answer. So uh, I'll, I'll continue maybe at the end of the presentation. If anybody wants to add anything again, we can add. Thanks for that. Uh, so, um, so tools uh, driven approach to software development uh, doesn't cut it. And when you have to write software that scales by default. So what I mean by this is that I know a lot of people will be wondering about that. What are you trying to see? Uh, but when you look at it, what I mean by tools driven approach, I know sometimes uh, when we when when you develop software, 
uh, probably I know those of those guys who have used um, Microsoft and uh, probably Visual Studio to you see when you are creating a Windows Form application, you just drag and drop uh, stuff there, and then you generate code, and then probably you just had some kind of event uh, that probably fetch data from the database. And then uh, you just get to do whatever functionality you want to do. So uh, with this approach of to software development, if you are going to think about writing software at scale, if you are going to think about writing software that's going to evolve over time, you have to move away from this paradigm of thinking about slinging code here and there, just organizing things the way you want. So if you are going to, the reason why most of these frameworks that we've used today, the reason why Ruby on Rails is a framework, the reason why Django is a framework, the reason why React has evolved over time is because uh, they followed, they probably used a better architecture. They went through an architectural decision that made them choose whether to go with this approach or to go with the uh, approach. So there are trade-offs when you are thinking about this. So my next slide, I'll be sharing something that uh, those, I think those who have studied computer science would have seen, or if you have read uh, something about uh, computers, you would have seen these. So the diagram you are seeing in front of your screen, uh, it's a computer architecture. And when you're looking at the diagram, well, you notice that we have the memory, we have the CPU, and we have the IO bus, and then we have some other input and output this thing that links to that. So when you look at this diagram where today, uh, I will not be focusing on, I will not be talking about scaling infrastructure. I will not be talking about scaling vertically or scaling horizontally. Uh, these, these are various ways, these things, there are various ways things can be done. But today, I'll focus more specifically on the memory and also focus uh, on the CPU. So th th that's what my focus would be today. So today, I'll just be focusing about how to write uh, applications that are memory efficient, uh, putting, how to think about uh, the CPU, how to think about memory uh, as you write your application. So change uh, is one of the biggest challenge faced by uh, software engineers and organizations as they uh, write or architect uh, or try to solve a problem. It is, an in it is inevitable, you can't avoid change and we necessarily know that you can also plan ahead for every change. Uh, but by applying uh, good architectural patterns, you can mitigate its negative effects on the systems that you design. Uh, we often compare software architecture to the architecture of physical building, um, but, but that won't be a fair comparison. Uh, changing the structure of a physical building is time consuming, uh, it's labor intensive, and it is very expensive, and it is very expensive. Uh, why this is true is because uh, business rules will definitely change. Uh, making changes to an existing software architecture could be challenging. Uh, workflows are changing to adapt to business, to business need. Technology is evolving very fast. So this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, modifying or uh, changing the existing code base is really a challenge. And if you don't get into the practice of doing it right, uh, you end up writing software that can evolve. You end up writing, you end up trying to rewrite software. You end up trying to just do things the way you want. And at the end of the day, uh, you, it's, it's a catastrophe. Uh, the software can even evolve uh, over time. So as we look into the next slide, uh, these are some of the considerations that uh, software engineers or solutions architects uh, need to look at when they are thinking about building a software. So I divide them into uh, three, uh, prop, and these I represented them in a Venn diagram. Uh, you see there you have user, you have business, and then you also have the system. So you have to think about the user of your application. And you also have to think about the business goals. Uh, you have to think about the domain knowledge. What is the problem you are trying to solve? And then you also have to think about the system, the underlying system. Sometimes some of these things, uh, you can't really uh, absorb or try to get a, a right way to solving the problem. So when you're talking about architectural design, you are looking at trade-offs. You are looking at various ways. 
why is it that why do I have to go uh, with this kind of architectural design? Am I looking at the security of the system? Are you looking at cost? Are you looking at maintainability of the application? Are you looking at performance? Or are you even looking at time and then usability? So when you try to build software, when you try to write software, I think uh, these are some of the three concerns that you need to look about or you need to think about when uh, planning or designing uh, an architecture of a system. So uh, I know some of you would have seen this diagram uh, somewhere before. Uh, so uh, the layered architectural pattern, I think this is the basic funda this is the basic foundation of all architectural patterns that you have seen uh, all over the years, uh, like MVC, uh, the client server architectural patterns, and all the other patterns that we have, the cloud uh, uh, client microservices architecture, all these architecture are solely based on this layered architecture uh, pattern that you are seeing here. It is a high level pattern that impacts the overall structure of the application, both logically and then physically. Uh, layered architecture pattern embodies the principles of separation of concerns, which I'll be talking about later on in this uh, workshop. So the domain layer, uh, when you look at this diagram, it talks about separating concerns. Uh, it's more focused on how do you write softwares and how do you write softwares that, are, that you can manage at scale? How do you write softwares uh, that can evolve over time? So when you look at the diagram, you have different layers. And what do you, you have different layers. And the layers that we have there are entirely uh, different. We have the data layer. We also have business layer. And then we also have the presentation layer. So what this means is that we don't want to couple everything together. We don't want to uh, put everything all in one box. Because when we do that, uh, that is going to lead to a software that is not going to be easy to modify or easy to change. So um, what do I mean by writing a software that scales by default? I know uh, a lot of people will be thinking about uh, various, uh, will be thinking about, you have a lot of things coming to your mind on how this should be. But when I look at uh, software that scales by default, from my experience, I see three things in common in them. So you need to be thinking about uh, performance as the application grows. You need to also be thinking about organization of your code as the project grows. And also, you also need to be thinking about maintainability as the team grows. So uh, I'll try to uh, kind of touch more on, on some of all these things that I've talked about. I know you would have seen some of these screens before. Uh, this is a request timeout screen. Uh, so what are some of the tips about optimizing uh, performance as the application grows? So uh, this has, I'll be sharing some tips on how to optimize performances. So when you look at this, uh, when you look at an application or you look at entire software, uh, you will notice that there are some things that are common within them. And there are some things that uh, you, you will see in most uh, architecture, you will see the data layer, as I've shared around. You are going to see presentation layer. You're also going to see uh, some uh, service or uh, microservices layer that you are going to be seeing over there. So one of the things that I've seen over time is that uh, people mistake that people tend to make is that uh, one of the things is that you people tend to, uh, I'll say, let the database do what uh, it knows how to do. Why am I saying this? Uh, I've seen code bases, or I've seen code where uh, you are trying to fetch data from the database and what the output of, or the end result of what you are trying to do is probably just to get the sum or probably are trying to sort that data. Instead of, uh, instead of sorting that data in memory, instead of uh, probably because maybe your language that you are using, uh, maybe if you are using Python or whatever language provided, provides you a construct that help you to sort or uh, aggregate that data. It would be good for you to, it would be the best uh, way, it would be best for you to uh, use, allow the database do its work. So the, that, the database has been designed in such a way uh, that it allows for aggregating or sorting of data. So there's no need to be handling that in your code base. Try and write an SQL query uh, that can aggregate that data for you. And also another thing that I've seen again is like uh, a lot of, uh, 
software engineers are not proactive about performance. Uh, they kind of they are kind of reactive. Uh, like okay, let's ship the code. Uh, whenever anything happens, we monitor those changes on the server. Whenever this happens, uh, whenever anything happens on the server, we we are going to uh, respond to that change. But our but when you're going to be writing software that scales by default, you need to be proactive about performance upfront. And I know performance is a very difficult topic to talk about uh, because some of it uh, you can't you can't say that this is a fact about performance unless you have measured it unless you've measured it against your own configuration so so i would say there are a lot of tools out there that you can use to uh, even check your performance uh, check your check the memory consumption of the applications that you are even writing before you even deploy i know uh, some tools like we have scout apm and uh, data dogs it's even there and there are a lot of them uh, just to mention a few. So uh, with Scout APM, uh, you can you can see uh, you can look at you can see various aspects of your application uh, that are taking a lot of memory. So you can see, like in this diagram I'm showing right here, uh, we have the, the the this diagram is showing us uh, this controller. It's taking a lot of allocations of memory so you can identify this memory bloat probably you are loading a lot of data into memory so when you are proactive about this some of all these things will not even get to um, production so although as i said earlier on it's difficult to measure uh, performance but with tools like this uh honey tools like this you can uh, automate those process and then you'll be able to see uh, various aspects of your applications uh, that and needs to be optimized instead of rewriting the whole entire code base because uh, something is not working uh, the way it's supposed to work or the, the application is not performing the way it's supposed to perform. So I, I'll say there are a lot of tools out there. You can look up uh, many of those tools. So uh, the entire goal of this is like, you need to be proactive about uh, performance upfront. Uh, also other ways to tips like, I like don't keep the user waiting for too long. Uh, we have background jobs there. There are a lot of uh, background jobs that you can use. Uh, background jobs are applications, uh, uh, constructs that we have there. We have a lot of tools out there that you can use to uh, probably uh, take away all this responsibility from your application. When you notice that an application is going to take for, it's going to take, uh, or you think a server is going to take uh, like more, more than a second, uh, to uh, to send data to the client, uh, you can probably uh, delegate that work to a background job to do that for you. Uh, probably you are generating, I've seen a lot of constructs in uh, applications, uh, highly intensive application where they are trying to generate a report and generating the report has to do with aggregating a lot of data from um, various uh, data sources. It can be from single sources or it can also be from various uh, sources that you can think of. So. In those kind of scenarios, you can allow a background job handle that for you. And also, you should think about the number of queries that you are generating in your applications. Uh, you'll be having, I know a lot of people, if you're talking about web applications, uh, the popular architectural patterns that we use there, it's MVC. Uh, some, and in the MVC layer, we have the uh, module layer, and the module layer, uh, most uh, MVC architectures have. Uh, it probably an ORM, so that's an object relational uh, mapper that helps to handle certain. Sometimes these things uh, doesn't scale really well. So when you are writing, when you are writing code, uh, try to avoid, uh, try to avoid, try to look at the number of queries that uh, probably when you are making a call to fetch some records from the database, we are trying to do something to the database. Try to see uh, to minimize, if possible, the number of queries that you are generating on uh, to, you are generating and the ones that are hitting the actual databases. Also, another thing again, you, you can also think, yeah, you can also consider it's like thinking about uh, batching for mass updates. Uh, if you're going to update a large amount of data, uh, don't try to load all those data in memory uh, because uh, if, you, if you notice the earlier problem I shared, uh, where Samuel was talking about how to handle that, you notice that he was talking about uh, memory constraint over there. We have, uh, we, we don't have all the memory at hand. 
So if you're writing applications that's going to perform at scale, uh, you need to be thinking about uh, your memory consumption. You need to be thinking about uh, how efficient it's your program. You need to think about how much CPU you have even using. And as I said earlier on, there are a lot of tools out there uh, that you can use to monitor that, those even whilst in development. So uh, I'll, I'll be sharing, uh, also be sharing tips about how to maintain uh, your application code as the uh, project grows and also how to organize your code as the um, project grows. So when, as I said earlier on, uh, the major reason why uh, most of these frameworks that we use today uh, succeed uh, is because they tend to follow a particular philosophy, uh, they tend to follow a particular design pattern, they try to follow a particular way of writing software that's easy to absorb change. So when I'm talking, you notice that I'm stressing about change here because as I said earlier on, uh, software can change, would definitely change in so many ways. So when you don't think, when you, when you don't put all this into consideration, when you start architecting your solution or when you, try, when you start designing your solution, you try to, you end up building, uh, you end up uh, designing a software that is difficult to manage, that is difficult to perform at scale, that is also difficult to be tested. So uh, when you are talking about maintaining your code base, you need to think about uh, test driven development. I've seen a lot of code bases today uh, that uh, they don't even have some, uh, they don't have any form of test driven um, development. Even unit testing is not, even, uh, even unit testing is not included in the code base. They are not doing a lot of unit testing and uh, a lot of high uh, profile companies are following corporate of these. Uh, you need to think about your deployment patterns uh, you don't have, I've seen uh, 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 some startups, I've also seen some, uh, some high profile companies uh, when they are pushing, they don't even have uh, a deployment pattern uh, of how to deploy applications. Some of them just do probably a git push uh, to their server and if they have probably, they have different, uh, server, uh, different uh, code bases for different, uh, for the front end, they have a code for front end, they also have a code for to manage their backend, they have to run git push command on, on those um, repositories. I think uh, that approach or that style of uh, designing software uh, cannot scale. Also, you also need to think about source code management. I know a lot of you might have known of this. I've seen companies uh, who don't even use uh, Git. They feel like it's a challenge or it's a problem uh, for them uh, using Git or all the various revision control that you have. So uh, before I go, uh, we also need to think about uh, design principles. And uh, the, a lot of design principles uh, that you need to talk about, that I'll be talking about is uh, separation of concerns and then uh, don't repeat yourself uh, paradigm. So you don't, want to, uh, you don't want to couple a lot of things into your code base. You want to think about how you organize your code. You want to think about how you pull things together. You just don't want to sling code here and there into, into your application code base. Uh, when you do that, uh, you definitely see that uh, your code base uh, would not, you definitely see that the application is not going to be able to scale as your team grows. The application is not going to be able to, it's not going to be able to scale as uh, the organization or as business changes, as business rules start evolving, the application is not going to be able to change also. So I would like to end uh, my presentation with this and then probably we can take some questions and also uh, uh, we also be talking about, I also want to hear from you about what you think about uh, writing softwares that scales by default. So I would say it is hard to read code than to write it. So um, I've seen a lot of people uh, don't think about uh, the code that they write. And some of them uh, just try to like, probably just put in a lot of things together. You also, you need to be thinking about your variable names. You need to be thinking about a lot of things. You need to be thinking about how you even think about organizing the code. Uh, two years from now, three years from now, how will some, when somebody, when you are looking at your code, will you be able to understand what you've written? Uh, will you be able to understand how this code is going to change over time? So 
I would say uh, don't spend too much time upfront trying to think about the design of a software system upfront uh, because this can be counterproductive because uh, you might be trying to waste your time on something that is likely to change uh, no matter what you try to do. Uh, so try to think about uh, doing the small level of design upfront, uh, institute software development practices uh, that can help you absorb change as you go. Uh, and, as a, and also one thing you need to know is that uh, you don't know what you don't know. You can you can't know everything upfront. And when you need to do, when you need to write, when you are writing software that perform at scale, just try to do um, and then see to go another big thing i would like to say is uh, avoid rewrite a lot of companies today we see you see them trying uh rewriting their entire code base uh when you even do that uh it might even go against your business uh your business one and sometimes it's cost intensive so probably you can look at you can look at various ways of optimizing uh, various portion of your app but when you think about writing software of skills when you think about some of the things that i've, I've talked about you realize that when you are proactive about all these things, when you think about how you use memory, when you think about how, the, how you're using your CPU, uh, you end up uh, probably like solving most of all these things. Uh, most of all these things that I've mentioned, most of all these performance bottlenecks that I've, I've cited here. So, but with time, you get to know that you get to understand various architectural patterns, you get to use them uh, in your code base. So uh, today, uh, my focus generally has just been talking about how to uh, write uh, software that scales uh, by uh, default. And then I talked about uh, three things. Uh, talking about, I talk about uh, how to think about performance as your application grows, how to think about how you maintain uh, maintainability of the application as, uh, your team grows and also how you organize your code as the project grows. Thanks, Joseph. This has been good. I love how precise it was and to the point. So I hope like, uh, you know, the people who are on the call have been able to get, you know, some insights into, you know, building uh, software that scales by default. So thanks for that. Uh, I truly appreciate it. But thank you so much, Joseph, for this.